time to hear and think about God's word. Before we hear God's word, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we listen to your word this morning, please give us the humility to receive it, the understanding to know what it means, and the desire to do what you say. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's reading is from James chapter 1. From James, a slave of God and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grace to all of God's people who are scattered around the world. My brothers and sisters, consider it as pure joy when all kinds of trials come into your life. Do this because the testing of your faith through trials will produce endurance. Make sure you let endurance finish its good work in you so that you will be made mature and complete, lacking in nothing. If you need wisdom, you should ask God, and he will give it to you, because God is generous and gracious to everyone. But when you ask, you must have faith and not doubt, because anyone who doubts is like a wave in the ocean that is blown around by the wind. If you are like this, then you are a double-minded person, unstable in everything you do. A person like this should not expect or receive anything from the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as you can see, we're starting a, a new series on a little letter, uh, which was written by the brother of Jesus, uh, James. And this letter is, I think, one of the most important bits of the Bible, certainly the New Testament. Uh, lots of practical uh, knowledge for us to uh, learn and to apply. So how about we begin by praying. Father, we thank you that you, uh, in your graciousness and kindness, are so eager to share yourself with us, uh, what is in your heart, what works, what is good. And so we thank you for this letter of James that you uh, inspired him to write, uh, which speaks very practically of life. And Father, we pray that uh, the faith that you have given to us, that we will certainly learn to live by it through your words. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, friends, today I want to begin just by uh, reading out a, a verse from the Bible uh, for you. And I, what I would like you to do is to try and guess who actually wrote these words. Now, when I read them out and you think you know, don't say anything, but uh, I'll read it out. Try and work out who said these words. Thank you, George. The verse is this. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or earth or by anything else, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. Now, who do you think said these words? Well, if you thought it was Jesus who said these words, you're very, very close. Because although Jesus did say something very similar to this in Matthew's Gospel, these particular words here are from James chapter 5. And what I found very interesting about reading the letter of James is it sounds so much like Jesus. You know, when you start at the beginning and just read through, it sounds like there's this list of Jesus' greatest hits coming to you very quickly as you read through the letter of James. So I thought I'd give you just two more quick examples. This one, George. See if this, you think this sounds like Jesus. James says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbour as yourself. You're doing right. Well, that sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Very much so. And how about this one? Thank you, George. Just a, a second one. James says, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Well, that, that sounds like Jesus too. You see, friends, as we read through this letter of James, what's happening is James is bringing the words of Jesus into our lives. That's what the letter of James is. James, the brother of Jesus, is bringing the words of Jesus 
into our lives. And unlike the other New Testament letters, which are written by, you know, Paul and, and John, that sort of thing, James's letter isn't very complicated. You know, you don't have pages and pages of very long sentences which are very difficult to understand. James doesn't write like that. He is very clear, very simple. And I think that James was someone who liked to shoot from the hip. Because what he does, he uses short, sharp, rapid-fire phrases to teach us how to live in this world that God has made by living with God's wisdom. That's James's style. He shoots from the hip. One phrase after another. Not much of an argument, just telling us God's wisdom. And friends, the first thing that J uh, James teaches us about is to how to live wisely while you suffer. That's the first thing he does. The first thing in the letter to these people who are obviously suffering, he begins his letter by sharing some wisdom how to live wisely while we suffer. So listen to these words. Thank you, George. Right at the beginning. My brothers and sisters, consider it as pure joy when all kinds of trials come into your life. Now, when you read these words, immediately we have a question. And the question is, is it actually possible to live like this? I mean, this is a question we should be asking ourselves. Is it actually possible to have joy while we suffer? For example, can you lose your job and still experience joy? Can you have an exam tomorrow morning? and still be happy? Could it be that you're forced to go to hospital and you still are at peace? Is it actually possible to live the way that James explains here right at the beginning of his letter? Well, remarkably, God, our Father in the heavens all around us, he says, yes. Yes, it is. It is possible to experience joy while we suffer. Now, James is not saying we need to just sort of pretend. You know, frozen smile, everything's okay. He's not saying that at all. Instead, what he's saying is that having Jesus as a real presence in your life changes how we see our suffering. That's what James is trying to teach us here. He's saying that because you have Jesus in your life and you're learning to live your life with him, that helps us to see the suffering that is there. We can look at it in a different way. Look at what he says here in verse 2. Thank you, George. James says, my brothers and sisters, consider it as pure joy when all kinds of trials come into your life. Do this because the testing of your faith through trials will produce endurance. Now, friends, very basically here, what James is saying is that when we are suffering, God is very, very busy in your life. He's really busy in your life when you're suffering. And what he's busy doing is testing you, testing me. Now, this word test is, you know, it's a sort of a strange word. It has different meanings. And when we normally, when we hear the word test, we normally think of something like this. Thank you, George. We, we think of an exam situation at school. You know, hear the word test and you sort of start to sweat a little bit. You imagine the tables and the chairs and row upon row of nervous students not knowing what to do. You know, after a test, your wrist is, is really, really sore from having to write so much and your head hurts. You know, that's what we think when we hear the word test. 
God doesn't test us like that. The word test here has a different meaning. I mean, when I hear the word test, you know, immediately I think of letters A, D, F. Well, with God, it's not like that. He doesn't test us like that. He's not interested in grading us, you know, giving us an A or a D or an F. He's not interested in making us fail. The truth is God does not do this sort of thing to his children who are learning to live their lives with Jesus. And yet James says God tests us with suffering. Now, he's not testing us to fail or succeed. He is testing us to change us. That's God's purpose in allowing suffering to come into our lives, to change us. You see, God is working through suffering in order, for, in order to purify our faith in him. That's what the word test means. Now, to help us along, I just want to show you a picture. Thank you, George. This is more like what the Bible means by testing. Now, in this picture, a man is testing rock that has silver in it. And what he's doing is he's trying to get the silver out so he can use it. And the man tests or refines the rock, which really is you know, a mixture of dirt and other minerals as well as silver. And he tests it by heating the rock really, really, really hot until the rock becomes a liquid. And what happens then is that all the, the bad stuff that he doesn't need, everything that's not silver, it rises to the top. And then he just pours all the bad stuff out and he leaves the silver in. And friends, what's really interesting is that the man will keep doing this process, heating it up, pouring out the bad stuff, heating it up, pouring out the bad stuff. He'll keep doing it until he can look into the liquid and see his own face clearly. That's how you test silver. You keep going. You keep refining, you keep heating it up until finally you can see your reflection in the liquid. And then you know it's pure. It's pure silver. It's what I want. I can use it. Now I can stop testing. And friends, in many ways, it's like that with God and us. You see, God allows suffering to come into our lives to test us, to refine us, to remove all those bad things that live in us so he can see his good character in us. And he'll keep doing it all the way through life. He will allow suffering to come in to get rid of all the bad stuff, all the bad attitudes we have, all the bad habits we have, all the wrong ideas that we have, all the wrong thoughts that keep swirling around in our minds and all the wrong feelings that we have each day. God keeps refining through the fire of suffering to get rid of all that stuff. And he'll keep doing it all the way through our lives. He'll keep doing it until he can perfectly see his good character in us. When he can look at us and see Jesus, the character of Jesus, the goodness, 
the mercy, the gentleness, the forgiveness, the compassion of Jesus. That's when God knows I can stop now. The work is finished. And God does this incredible divine work in us by allowing difficult times, times of suffering, hardship, trials, the Bible calls it. He allows these things in to achieve his good purpose in us. And suffering you know, is not easy. It, it, it stretches us. It pushes us. It makes us cry and it makes us rely on God. And so what James is saying is, look, it's really important that God's people think about this, that they understand that this is what God is doing by allowing suffering. We have to think about it because it helps us think about suffering in the right way. It helps us experience joy in suffering and we have to prepare for suffering because suffering is inevitable i mean the only reason if you haven't suffered much in your life the only reason you haven't suffered much is because you're not old enough you're still too young if you haven't suffered you're young and so james is getting us ready to suffer well. You see, friends, what God is teaching us here through James is that there is a divine purpose in the suffering that we experience. For us, for the followers of Jesus, suffering is not random or a mistake because for us there is a divine purpose in our suffering and that purpose is to refine our faith in Jesus, purify it so that we are more and more like the Son of God. That is the wonderful outcome of trials in our lives. And very helpfully, James says that the way we are purified as we experience suffering is by this little thing called endurance. James says we have to have endurance. Look at these words, thank you, George. He says, look, so make sure you let endurance finish its good work in you, because if you do this, you will be made mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Friends, we need endurance. Now, I once heard a man say, the easiest thing to do in the world is to start running area marathons. It's the easiest thing. Anyone can do it. The hardest thing is to finish a marathon. The easiest thing is to start running in the marathon. Anyone can do that. Hardest thing, finishing the race. 42 long kilometres. And really the truth is that, you know, if you want to run in a marathon, you need running endurance. And that running endurance is a very specific thing. You know, you need good running technique. You need good breathing technique. You need to drink water at a, you know, a regular intervals. You need to just keep running and running and running until the race is over. You need to put up with pain and discomfort. These are all things that are part of running endurance. Do that and you will finish the race. Well, it's exactly the same with Christian endurance. Faithful endurance, not running endurance, faithful endurance that gets you home is a very specific thing. Here in his letter, James tells us, faithful endurance is a very specific specific thing and if we're going to make it to the end of the race we need that specific endurance you see friends the truth is when hardship comes into our lives 
automatically we have two choices to make. The first thing we can do is complain about the suffering. Now, what happens if you just complain about the suffering that you're in? Well, you learn nothing. Well, actually, you learn one thing. You learn how to be really good at complaining. That's what happens. You become an expert, professional, Christian complainer. That's your first option. Now, that's not the sort of endurance we need. That'll get us nowhere. The other thing we can do is to keep trusting God through the suffering. Now, if you do that, if you keep trusting God through the suffering, then an amazing thing happens. Your character begins to change. As we keep trusting God, our character very slowly begins to change. Our thoughts begin to change, our actions begin to change, our habits change, the way we look at ourselves begins to change, and the way that we look at other people, it all begins to change when we keep trusting God through the suffering. And James tells us very specifically the way we keep trusting God through the suffering is to do God's will. That's what we need to do. In the suffering, the way forward, the faithful endurance we need, that very specific thing that we must do is keep obeying God as we suffer. That's the endurance we need to finish the race. Keep doing God's will as we suffer. Friends, if you're a disciple of Jesus, please know this, that every bad thing that happens in our lives has a purpose. God is allowing it and he's using it to refine our faith in him. He's actually teaching us to keep doing his good in every situation, just like he keeps doing his good in every situation. Now, if you think about it, that's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, it's wonderful. God actually has a plan to change us so that we become more like Jesus. And that plan works. If we have that endurance, if we let that endurance teach us as we suffer, if we keep obeying and trusting God, we will change. Now, friends, thinking about this this morning, doesn't that fill you with just maybe a little bit of joy? You know, just, just a little bit of joy, knowing that as we suffer, God is at work, changing us. Doesn't that give you, you know, a bit of hope? Well, that's exactly what James is talking about here. That's why he says, consider it, it as joy. It's not joy, as joy. Why? Why joyous? Because God is at work. This is not wasted time. For non-Christians, it is wasted time. There's nothing going on good for them in suffering. For a follower of Jesus, God is at work as we trust in him. But friends, what do you do when you don't know what to do when you're suffering? I mean, that's an experience we've all had. Yeah, life's really hard, unbearable. What do I do? I don't know what to do. I want to run and hide. What do I do? Well, James tells us, thank you, George. 
He says, but if you need wisdom, you should ask God and he will give it to you because God is generous to everyone. Friends, if you've ever been confused, unsure of what to do while we suffer, James says very clearly, just ask God for wisdom. Ask him. And then don't worry too much. Don't worry about it. Because God will speak to you in some way. Maybe when you're reading the Bible, you know, the words of the Bible, maybe it could be the words of a friend. It could be here while you're at church. It could be while you're out of church. Don't worry. God will give you his wisdom in some way. In fact, God wants to give you his wisdom. That's what James says. God is generous to all. Ask and you will receive, as Jesus says. But straight away, James shoots from the hip and he says there's a problem. Be very careful when you ask because there is something very deep inside every human heart that will actually stop us from receiving God's wisdom. And that problem is this. Thank you, George. Listen to what James says. You know, when you ask God, you must have faith and not doubt because anyone who doubts is like a wave in the ocean that is blown around by the wind. If you were like this, you are a double-minded person and you are unstable in everything you do. A person like this should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Now, friends, this sounds very serious. And it is. Because although God is very generous and wants to share his wisdom, there is a problem that will actually stop us from receiving God's wisdom. And that problem is doubting God. Now, again, we have to be very careful with this word doubting because James is not saying you're not believing enough. He's not saying you need to try harder. You know, close your eyes and just mm, believe. That's not the doubt that James is talking about. And often this is what we think doubt looks like. But for James, he's not talking about that sort of doubt. Instead, he's saying, don't be like this man, thank you, George. Don't be a double-minded person. In other words, don't be a person who has two minds. For James, that is the delta. Someone who has two minds. And this is a really big problem for even Christians. We have two minds at the same time. One mind says, oh, I want to do it God's way. Yeah. The other mind says, I want to do it my way over here. And so the double-minded person who doubts God's way, there's this battle that's always happening. Will I do it my way? Will I do it God's way. That's how they doubt. And this deep conflict that happens in our soul makes us like a wave in the ocean that the wind blows one direction and then another. One minute, God's way. Next minute, my way. And friends, this conflict, this process, I think is at its worst when we suffer. That's the danger. When we are suffering, we become double-minded. We get weak in our trust of the Lord. We want to fix things our way, quickly. We want our results. We don't wait for God's results. And James says, no, you've got to be very, very careful. 
If you do this, if you are a double-minded person, you're very unstable. And if you need a picture in your head to help you with this, think of a three-legged stool and then take one of those legs away. That is the double-minded person. Very unstable. And of course, the other problem is, James says, that person who doubts God, who is double-minded, that person will receive no wisdom from the Lord. There he is, shooting from the hip again, saying it as it is. He's not very polite. He just says it. God will not help you if you are a double-minded person. And if you think about it, even if God does give his wisdom to a double-minded person, it's not going to help them anyway because they're not going to do it. They're going to do what they want. And so there's this battle between what I want for me and what God wants for me in suffering. And what God wants is for us to have endurance, to learn to trust him because he is good, because he knows what he's talking about, because he is working in that situation. God wants us to learn to keep doing his good. He refines our character. He refines and purifies our faith in him until we are more like his son. Friends, I think the letter of James is exactly what we need in our modern world today. I mean, people are so confused about how to live wisely. They have no idea how to cope with suffering. They don't know. And they don't experience joy. They pretend. They do other things to cover the hurt. But here James says, embrace what God is doing in you through suffering. And all the way through the letter, this is what James will do. He'll keep teaching us God's wisdom. He'll keep teaching us how to live God's way in God's world. And the first lesson this morning is very clear. He says, consider it as pure joy when hardship comes into your life. Because the testing of your faith in Jesus produces endurance. And endurance in doing good is the only way that we will be changed. And that should bring just a little bit of joy into our lives. Let's pray. Father, we find suffering and hardship and disappointment so hard. And in those moments, we want to run. We go back to our way of doing things. We try and solve them in our way. And yet you're... Your servant James tells us so clearly, no, keep trusting Jesus. Keep trusting his word. Endure in doing good. And we will be changed. Father, please help us to see our suffering with Jesus standing beside us so that we can handle it differently from the people around us, so that we can maybe even find joy in it, knowing that you are at work in it, right by our side. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, friends, in a few moments, we're going to learn of the... uh, We're going to remember the endurance that Jesus had in doing good while he suffered as we share the Lord's Supper. But first we're going to uh, sing a song, so if you'd like to stand.
Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for We're going to share in the Lord's Supper and remember what Jesus did to free us for a, a new life, a refreshing life, a good life, where we get to do things with Jesus by our side. So, friends, if you have turned to God and are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you are eagerly waiting for God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come again from heaven, this same Jesus who was raised from the dead and who saves us from the judgment which is coming soon, then this meal is for you. Now, if you haven't turned back to God, if you're not trusting in Jesus, if you're not living with Jesus in your life each day, just let the, um, the bread and the juice go past you. That's fine. But we do look forward to the day when you too will share in this meal as our brother and sister in the Lord. Now, friends, before we share in the Lord's Supper, we must examine ourselves. After all, we are the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, his people on earth. Therefore, we must confess our sin and be united in our fellowship together. And so I'm going to give you just a few minutes to sit there quietly. Please forget about everyone else around you. Maybe close your eyes. And I would like you to talk to God. Talk to the one who stands next to you and ask him to search you, to look inside your spirit and to bring up into your mind the things that he would like you or he would like to talk to you about, the things that we need to confess to him. So I'll give you just a minute or two. Sit there quietly and then we will confess our sins by saying a short prayer together. Friends, let us confess our sins to Almighty God using the words that you can see there on the screen. Let's say these words together. Heavenly Father, you love us so much, but we don't always love you. 
We cause you shame when we don't obey you. We are often proud, but you are good and very kind. Please forgive us, make us clean and change us. Enable us to live for you and to please you in every way. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Friends, God is very patient with us. He forgives anyone who turns to him and trusts in his son Jesus to be their saviour and Lord. So now we are friends with God and part of his family. We can say together, praise praise the Lord. We thank you especially for Jesus, our saviour. We thank you that he died on the cross to pay for our sins and to bring us forgiveness. We thank you that he was raised to life again to give us a new life where we live with you through the Holy Spirit, working in us each day. Amen. Friends, the night before he died, Jesus ate supper with his disciples. He thanked God and gave them the bread and said these words, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. And after the supper, he gave the cup to his followers and he said, drink from this cup. This is my blood that seals the new agreement between God and people. I give my life for you and many others so your sins can be forgiven. Every time you drink this together, remember me. Together? We are different people, but we are one in the Lord. Jesus died for us and so we share together and he returns. Friends, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate the freedom. We celebrate the the refreshment, the joy, the restoration that Jesus has won for us. And we proclaim three things to ourselves, to each other, and to this world. His perfect sacrifice made once for all on the cross, his resurrection, and his going to heaven in glory. So in a few minutes, when you eat the bread, remember that Christ died for you. He set you free from sin and death. So be thankful forever. And then as you drink from the cup, remember that Jesus gave his lifeblood for you. So be thankful forever. Friends, as you eat the bread, remember that Jesus died for you to set you free from sin and death, to give you a new life, of refreshment and joy and purpose where you live with him each day for his name. And friends, as you drink from the cup, remember that Jesus shed his lifeblood for you to free you from sin and death and to give you a new life. So be thankful for it. Now we have a short prayer of thanks that we'll say. Let's say these words together. Thank you, Father for the guarantee that we shall eat and drink with Jesus Christ when he comes again in the glory of his kingdom. Father, remember your people. By your spirit, enable us to live for you each day. Help us to live holy lives, to tell others about Jesus, and to eagerly await for his return. Amen. Amen.